If you would take your Bibles and open them to, to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 13. Matthew 19, verse 13. And as you're turning there, um, I want you to think about one famous person from American history, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was a very accomplished man. He was a founding father. He was a secretary of the treasury. He was the guy who pretty much designed our entire financial system. But despite all these, and he's on the $10 bill, by the way, so he's on your money. And you know you've made it if you make it on the money, right? But despite all of his accomplishments, Hamilton is best known in history as the guy who died in a duel at the hands of Aaron Burr. He died in a duel. Hamilton, this is, this is the thing that's interesting to me. Hamilton did not plan on dying that day. Right? He'd been in a dozen duels before. Each time he went, he would negotiate his way out of them. That was the custom back then. Uh, you know, that's how, they, that's how they settled stuff. You went in a duel and you, you would negotiate your way out. He probably assumed that he would do the same thing that day. He showed up for the duel. He assumed he would be able to negotiate his way out. In fact, he had a lunch meeting with a client on the books after the duel. But he didn't go to that meeting because he died. Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda popularized Hamilton's life in the musical. and In a recent interview, he commented on this great irony surrounding Hamilton's death. He says, how much time do we get on this earth? We don't know. They don't tell us at the outset how much time we get. It's something I've been sort of grappling with and terrified with. I think we all grapple with it. I think we all grapple with the paradox of knowing tomorrow's not promised, but making plans anyway. See, Hamilton wasn't promised tomorrow. Lin-Manuel Miranda isn't promised tomorrow. And you and I are not promised tomorrow. When your day comes... When you face death, hopefully not at the hands of a duel, but when that time comes and your life ends, what happens next? More importantly, how can you have hope after death? As we continue our study of the book of Matthew, we're going to meet a man who wants concrete answers to that very question. And when he meets Jesus, he finds an answer he didn't expect. If you look at Matthew 19, beginning in verse 13, follow along as I read aloud. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? <laughs> and Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and... You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? 
Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. The many who are first will be last, and the last first. In this passage, Jesus is going to teach us how we can have hope after death. And here it is in one sentence. Jesus and Jesus alone saves. And he shows us this in three key ways. First, Jesus saves by exposing our idols. Right, our story begins here with a couple of kids. You remember he, uh, there were some children there, and, and, and people wanted to bring these children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples of all people rebuked them for doing that. They said, no, 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 look, Jesus didn't have time for this. He's a busy man. Keep the kids away. we got other stuff to do. In response, Jesus doubly rebuked the disciples. He said, no, 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 let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. Why? He says, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus knows that children are inherently dependent. Right? Children, children would die without parents or adults to care for them. Jesus knows that that children are socially insignificant. Okay, you're not going to get brownie points for spending time with kids. In other words, children are just like the people that Jesus ushers into his kingdom. Kingdom people are also inherently dependent on God. We know we can't do anything on our own. We need God. Kingdom people know we're insignificant. We know in the scope of things we're nobodies. We don't have any illusions of grandeur. Jesus is the somebody. And in sharp contrast with these children and the kind of kingdom people Jesus is talking about, someone else approaches Jesus. We learn from other gospel accounts that this is the rich, young ruler. And he comes up to Jesus and he says this, verse 16, says, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And on one hand, this man seems like he's asking an honest question. Look, how can I have eternal life? How can I be saved, Jesus? But on the other hand, he's coming at the question from the wrong posture. He's assuming there's something he can do to make salvation possible. And Jesus responds here. He gently corrects the assumption. He says, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. He says, you you want to know what kind of good deed you should do? You're you're missing the point, man. Look, there's only one who is good, and it's God. And gently, Jesus is gently redirecting this man away from himself and his preoccupation with himself and pointing him back up to God. And then Jesus answers his original question. He says, okay, if you if you you want to do this, you got to keep the commandments. And the guy says, which ones? (laughs) Like if you're asking which ones, you're missing the point, right? But Jesus answers him anyway. He says, look, you you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus trots out just a bunch of the the commandments from the Ten Commandments, and he concludes with this catch-all, which is kind of a summary of, of the second half of the Ten Commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Basically, do it all. Love everybody perfectly, then you're in. The guy starts thinking. And he says, he says, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Now, clearly the man hasn't done all Ten Commandments perfectly, but he thinks he has, and Jesus plays along. He says, if you would be perfect, go. Sell what you possess. Give it to the poor. And you're going to have treasure in heaven. And then, this this is the big one, come and follow me. You get the sense here, this is a genuine invitation from Jesus. Jesus offers the man to come and follow him, just like he offered Peter and Andrew when they were there fishing one day. Or just like he offered James and John. But look at what happens. When the young man heard this, verse 22, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
The man claimed to be following God. He claimed to want to follow Jesus. But for him, following Jesus was too costly. So he turns Jesus down. He turns Jesus down for the sake of his stuff. You know, when I I was a kid, my parents took us on vacations to Colorado and Arizona and Utah and Pennsylvania to see all these, you know, beautiful parts of our creation and the parts of America. Needless to say, there was a lot of riding in cars during those trips. So I, I would get bored, so I would bring my Game Boy with me. Y'all remember Game Boys? Remember those things? Yeah. To pass the time during the dull spells, okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with having a Game Boy or doing that or whatever. But I would get so engrossed in my little game that I would miss what was going on outside. Right? We'd be driving by this beautiful red rock or these beautiful... Colorado mountains or, or the, the, these, these plains or whatever else, or, and, and I would miss it because I was concerned about beating the next level. Do you see how silly that was? Okay, I do. <laughs> In retrospect, my parents called me out at the time that they put the Game Boy away. Look, we drove all the way out here. Look outside. See, I, I wanted to miss the most important thing because I was so engrossed with the lesser thing. See that? It's kind of what this man's doing here. The rich man misses the most important thing, Jesus, because he's too engrossed with his money, with his stuff. And Jesus calls him out on it, and he exposes the man's idols. And he tells him to do something about it, and the man thinks that's too much. Now, perhaps you think Jesus was being just a little bit picky with this guy. (laughs) You know, why does he ask him to give up his money? Isn't that a little bit extreme? But the issue here was never really about the money itself, okay? The takeaway lesson here isn't that we should all go sell our stuff and give it all to the poor. There's a deeper thing going on here. Jesus was asking these questions, making these requests to probe this man's heart. And in so doing, he exposed the one thing this man was unwilling to give up. The one thing that he had to cling on to What's his stuff? D.A. Carson says, given the choice between money and Jesus, money wins for this guy. So for this man, then, money wasn't just a possession. It wasn't just something in the bank. Money was his idol. It was his God. It was his slave driver. Functionally, money was the thing he devoted his life to. It was the thing he found the most joy in. It was the thing that he was most unwilling to give up. So this man received a personal invitation from Jesus and he walked away from it because he loved something else more. He encountered Jesus hoping to find an easy checklist for doing stuff to get to heaven. Instead, Jesus exposed his idols, urged him to take extreme measures to rid of them, and he just just walked away. Now, maybe you think that today idolatry is not a problem for us, right? We live in the 21st century. We don't have idols, right? We don't have little stone statues in our homes or golden calves in the garage or we don't burn incense to pictures of grandpa in the den, right? But that doesn't mean that idolatry is gone. See, the problem with idolatry was never the thing itself. It wasn't with the money. It wasn't with the rock. It wasn't anything else. It was our messed up hearts. And today, our sinful hearts are still experts at taking good things and making them ultimate things. See, we all have things that our hearts are driven towards, things that we want to give ourselves to. Many times they are, like I said, good things. But they fight for control of our life. And for us, given the choice between Jesus and that thing, too many of us, on too many days, would choose that thing. What is that thing for you? What is that thing that dominates your conversation? The thing that lingers on your mind as you drift off to sleep. It's the first thing on your mind when you wake up. What's the thing that you get testy about when people try to bother you about it? 
What do you talk or share the most about on Facebook or social media? Where does most of your money go? What is the thing that you have your identity wrapped up in so that if that thing were gone, you wouldn't know who you were? Is it a relationship? Is it a hobby? Is it your children or grandchildren? Is it your work? Is it, is it yourself? Or is it an addiction? This morning, let Jesus expose that idol just like He exposed the rich young rulers. And don't make the same mistake He did. Drop the idol. It's not worth it. And accept Jesus' invitation to follow Him because when you die, that idol will not and cannot save you. Jesus and Jesus alone saves. So first, Jesus saves by exposing these idols in our hearts. Secondly, Jesus saves by doing the impossible. And so as this rich man walks away, Jesus turns to his disciple and he has some pretty pointed words here. He says, verse 23, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus tells his disciples, look, it is hard. It is hard for a rich guy like him to get into the kingdom of heaven, to get eternal life. It's easier actually for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And, and for years, this is interesting, for years people have tried to explain away that little illustration. I, I've heard this, maybe you've heard this, you know, people say, you know, there, there might have been this gate in the region called the eye of the needle, and, and, uh, and camels may have had to crouch to go under them, and and so Jesus is saying here that it's, that it's kind of hard for rich people to get into heaven, but it's kind of feasible, you know. And You ever heard that before? Maybe not. I, I've heard that before. Here's the problem with all that, though. None of it's true. <laughs> there were no gates called the, 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 the eye of the needle. Jesus is intentionally, this is the point, is intentionally shocking his disciples. He takes the biggest animal that they know, a camel, and tries to shove it into the smallest little thing they can think of, the eye of the needle. So Jesus is intentionally giving this provocative illustration to say, look, it is hard. It's almost impossible for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven. Because wealth is the cruelest idol of them all. You, know, you get a little wealth, you get a little money. It feels good. So you want a little more, and you want a little more, and you want a little more, and it's never enough. Ultimately, money isn't serving you, you are serving it. Well, the disciples heard this, and they were just kind of dumbfounded by what Jesus said. Verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? See, in this time, this culture, wealth was considered a blessing from God. And they're thinking, right, if you had a lot of money, then God was blessing you. And if God was blessing you, you were living right, right? So they thought rich people, like this rich guy just walked away, they were the godliest of them all. And if these people couldn't get into heaven, who in the world can? Jesus anticipates this question and he responds, verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. You're right. <laughs> you can't get into heaven this way. But with God, all things are possible. So Jesus is right. It, it is impossible for the best of the best of the best to get into heaven. Here's why. Remember all those demands of the law? He told the rich man to follow. Follow this, follow that, follow that, follow that. All those commandments that he had to do. We got to keep them too. If we want to get into heaven, we got to keep every single one perfectly for our entire lives. We got to make every right choice. We got to refrain from doing every bad thing. We got to have a perfect attitude, perfect heart, perfect thoughts at all times for our entire life. This is what the law demands of us. Can you do that? It's impossible. It is impossible, even for the best of us. I, mean, I think of Billy Graham. I can think of no more godly 
man than Billy Graham. Right? He's exuded a long life of character, of integrity, of honesty, of godliness. I have immense respect for Billy Graham. But you know what? Held to this standard, Billy Graham would be on a fast track to hell. And he would be the first to tell you that. So Jesus says, you're right. That is impossible. But there's a but there. <laughs> but with God, all things are possible. He doesn't explain here what he means by that, but we know the rest of the story, don't we? We know what happens at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. We know that God saves wicked sinners just like you, just like me, not by ignoring all those faults and failures, not by sweeping them under the rug, but by nailing those faults and failures onto the cross with Jesus. See, Jesus did follow these laws perfectly. He was the only one in all of history to ever do so. And he willingly subjected himself to death. He hung helplessly on a cross, enduring physical torture for men, divine judgment for the Father, because he bore our sins. So he could give us his righteousness. See, God does the impossible here, not by ignoring all our failures, but by sending Jesus to take the fall for them. That's why Jesus and Jesus alone saves Here's what this means for you this morning. You can't be saved by doing enough good things. You can't be saved by doing enough, by being enough, by serving enough. You can't do it. And the penalty for your failure to do these things is eternal judgment from God in hell. That's what this word says. But God can and will do the impossible because of what Jesus did on the cross. Like the rich man, you've got some idols in your life. You've got to let go of those things. Trust in the Jesus who died in your place and live for His glory. And when you do that, God does the impossible. God saves you from your sins. He saves you from the penalty that you deserve. He brings you into this community called the church. And He uses you, of all people, to share His gospel and His plan to reach the world. This morning, will you let God do the impossible in your heart and in your life? The third thing we see here is Jesus saves by promising eternal rewards. So after he addresses this rich man about this man who won't give up his idol, Peter speaks, verse 27, Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Peter says, Jesus, what about us? We have given up everything. And absolutely everything. And a lot of times Peter sounds like he's whining. And maybe he is here, but, but he's telling the truth. He and Andrew gave up stable fishing jobs. Matthew gave up a lucrative job as a tax collector. Simon the Zealot left the revolution to follow Jesus. And they did these things. They gave up everything to follow a wandering homeless teacher who routinely ticked off the religious leaders they had grown up admiring. Okay? So Peter wonders, what about us? We have done this, Jesus. And Jesus answers pretty compassionately. Verse 28, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus rarely gives us concrete details about his coming kingdom. Usually he speaks kind of vaguely, but he, he does give concrete details here. He says, when I come, when I make the world right, you guys, you 12, are going to sit on the 12 thrones 
judging the tribes of Israel. I don't know what that means exactly. It could be literal, it could be figurative, but it sounds pretty important, doesn't it? It sounds like an immense honor. Jesus says, everyone who has lost something for me, whether you've lost your home or your family or anything else, you're going to receive far more in eternity. You may be last now, but one day you will be first. So Jesus is saying, look, I save and I offer rewards. And this is an important truth for us to get because for some people, doing what he says here, dropping those idols, following Jesus is costly. For the Christian in North Korea, following Jesus is costly. For the believer in Iran, following Jesus is costly. For the Christian who wants to work on Wall Street or in a cake bakery and still maintain his convictions, following Jesus may be costly. Now around here, following Jesus has been relatively easy for us for a long time. But that could be changing. I can envision a future not too many years from now where preaching or living the truths of the Bible will get you in hot water, maybe even legal hot water. But we got to believe what Jesus says here. Following him is worth it. The rewards he promises will far, far outweigh the cost of following Jesus now. Let me tell you the story to illustrate this of Bashir Kamel. You've probably never heard of Bashir Kamel. But Catherine Jean Lopez tells his story in the National Review. She says, Um, If you recall, maybe two years ago, there were a group of Egyptian Christians who were beheaded on a beach by ISIS terrorists. And, uh, And Bashir was one of those martyrs' brothers. And when he went on TV sometime after that to talk about his brother who died for his faith, listen to what Bashir said. He said, we are proud to have this number of people from our village who have become martyrs. Since the Roman era, Christians have been martyrs and have learned to handle everything that comes our way. This only makes us stronger in our faith because the Bible told us to love our enemies and bless those who curse us. And he further explained that his mother would welcome any of the men who killed her son She would welcome them into her home if they would come. She said if one of them were to visit, she would, quote, ask God to open his eyes because he was the reason her son entered the kingdom of heaven. Kamel concluded by praying for his brother's killers. He said, dear God, please open their eyes to be saved and to quit their ignorance and the wrong teachings they were taught. That is not normal. It is not normal to talk about the person who killed your brother or killed your son in this kind of way. The only way you can do this is if you know that for the Christian, death is not the end of the story. Or if you know that if you give up your life for Jesus, that the rewards are far going to outweigh what you've done. These martyrs, these martyrs weren't promised tomorrow. Neither are we. Do you have the kind of faith that Bashir Kamel and his brother had? If you were to greet death today, do you have the kind of assurance that they had? If not, take care of that before you walk out these doors this morning. Because the truth is that Jesus, this Jesus, and He alone saves He gives you peace now, yes, but He gives you rewards for eternity. This morning, will you identify that idol in your heart and your life and drop it? Will you let God do the impossible by trusting in the death and resurrection of Jesus? And will you believe the promises that Jesus offers here that you would be willing to die for them? We're going to conclude this morning. With him, 581. As we do, I, I want to read the first verse to you and think about what this hymn tells us. 
we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward. Tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Let's pray. Father, we believe that Jesus saves. Would you this morning come into our time, into this room, would you identify the idols in our hearts? Would you convict us of them so we would drop them and follow you instead? God, we believe that you can do the impossible. You can take wretched sinners like us, and turn us into redeemed saints. And I pray if there is anyone here who has never done that, maybe they're trusting in their own, uh, their own good deeds. Maybe they're trusting in, in the fact that they've, they've come to church sometimes. Maybe they're trusting in the fact that they try to serve. Let them know that they can trust in no thing other than Jesus. If there's anyone here who has never trusted in you, may they repent this morning, turn to you, and place their faith in you. And God, they would come tell us so we can celebrate with them what God is doing. Father God, be at work. Teach us. Grow us. Convict us. Use us for your will. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.